Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this webinar. Uh, my name is David Wilcox. I'm the uh, program leader for Fedora here at Lyricis. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on Fedora 6 over the last few months. Uh, and so I just wanted to take this opportunity to provide uh, an overview for, uh, uh, for everyone. So I thought I'd start just by talking a little bit uh, about the motivations behind uh, Fedora 6. Um, and uh, some of you might be aware that we had uh, recently completed some grant work, um, the Designing a Migration Path grant, which was funded by the IMLS, um, was uh, designed to investigate barriers to migration from uh, previous versions of Fedora, particularly Fedora 3. Uh, and there were um, lots of interesting outcomes from that, uh, uh, from that grant effort. The complete report is available and we'll provide these uh, slides so everyone can uh, review that if, uh, if you haven't already. But, um, there were a couple of broad themes or concerns that emerged from that work, uh, and they revolved around these um, ideas of effort and value uh, in the sense that uh, for those that were trying to migrate from a previous version of Fedora, um, they were uh, encountering uh, and trying to move into Fedora 4 or 5. Um, they were looking at, on the one hand, the effort that might be involved in that migration, and on the other hand, uh, the, the perceived value of migrating to this uh, new version of, uh, uh, of the platform. Um, and basically, if the effort was high and the perceived value was low, uh, then it created a kind of decision point where institutions would have to decide whether they were going to undertake the migration or stick with Fedora 3, uh, or maybe evaluate a different platform to, uh, uh, to move to. Uh, and so recognizing these uh, kind of barriers that are existing in the community really wanted to uh, use Fedora 6 as an opportunity to, uh, to address some of these concerns. So we have a couple of uh, really three high level goals with, uh, with Fedora 6. Um, and these are kind of addressing these, these areas of concern that uh, came out of the designing a migration path work. Uh, so one uh, relates to reducing the effort required to migrate, uh, just recognizing that uh, really if the effort is very high, uh, then that creates a significant barrier to moving into the software. And I'll talk about some of the ways that we're uh, reducing that effort. Uh, this applies certainly to those that are using Fedora 3, but also to those that are using uh, version four or five, uh, or potentially those that are using other uh, software platforms. Uh, just the nature of the changes that we're making uh, really do kind of reduce uh, the effort required to migrate both now, but also in the future. Um, and at the same time, uh, on the value side of things, we're really focused on enhancing uh, long-term digital preservation support in Fedora, uh, as well as uh, improving the performance and scale. Um, I think we've heard from our community that there's a strong interest in using Fedora for digital preservation use cases. And in versions four and five, a lot of the focus was around uh, standardizing the software, uh, adding support for uh, more robust support for linked data. Um, but now we really want to return to uh, digital preservation as one of the, the, the core features that we want to enhance uh, as part of Fedora. Um, and as well, uh, there were some uh, issues around performance and scale that we, uh, that we also want to address. So in terms of how we plan to get there, one of the major things that we're doing with Fedora 6 is uh, removing the uh, and replacing the, the mode shape component of the software. Um, so some of you may know mode shape is the uh, open source application that Fedora uh, 4 and 5 are currently built on top of. Um, it's its own software application um, and it served us fairly well in the early days of Fedora 4 because it allowed us to um, build on top of something rather than uh, writing a whole bunch of custom code to provide the features that we wanted to provide through Fedora. And, and a lot of this is done, um, it, we, we essentially layered a, an API on top of uh, mode shape. But uh, particularly a lot of the performance and scale concerns uh, that have arisen in versions four and five really are uh, uh, due to this, uh, this mode shape uh, part of the application. And so um, one of the main things we're doing here is, is removing this application and replacing it with a different persistence layer, uh, and in particular one that implements uh, the Oxford Common File Layout. Um, if you're not aware of this initiative, I'm going to spend some time over this webinar talking about the, the high-level benefits um, of the OCFL, as it's sort of commonly referred to. Um, uh, but this is one of the major things that we're, we're doing with uh, Fedora, and, uh, Fedora 6, and really this addresses the uh, migration concerns, but also the uh, digital preservation concerns and the performance and scale concerns. Um, 
at the same time, we really don't want to make uh, significant changes at the API layer. So one of the things moving from version four to five was really just aligning with this uh, newly specified and documented Fedora API. Uh, you can find that documentation online if, uh, if you're interested. And so we really don't want to make major client side changes that would impact for example, Islandora or Sembera applications or other applications that might be uh, currently written against Fedora 5. Um, and, and instead really focus on that underlying persistence layer as the, uh, the main target for uh, what we're doing with, uh, with Fedora 6. Um, and at the same time, recognizing that uh, you know, the need for robust migration tooling and support and documentation is really important. So we're uh, really committed to uh, not releasing Fedora 6 uh, until we have this uh, migration tooling and support um, available uh, alongside the software. And I'll, I'll, we've, uh, we've already made some significant strides there and I'll, uh, I'll be talking about that as, uh, uh, as we go here. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the Oxford Common File Layout because this is the most uh, significant new feature that we're adding to, uh, to Fedora. And at a high level, really this is just a, a simple a uh, non-proprietary specified open standards approach to the layout of preservation persistence. And what that means is that the OCFL is not concerned with, for example, storage technologies, but rather just how content is actually laid out in a hierarchical file and folder type structure uh, in whatever storage media you happen to be using. Um, and this really offers a, a number of high level benefits. I'm not gonna go into a lot of the technical details of the OCFL here, uh, I have some links if you want to explore, for example, the, the structure of content and how everything looks on disk. Uh, really here, I'm just trying to talk about the, uh, uh, the high level benefits and, um, and I'll go through these and, and, and provide some additional detail here. But um, one of them is just the notion of parsability so that both humans and machines can read the uh, information, the data independent of the, uh, the original software. Um, also robustness, so this sort of strong sense of fixity, checksums uh, to guard against uh, errors and corruption um, and, and also uh, migration between storage technologies. Uh, there is a sense of versioning, so you can make changes to objects and have those changes tracked over time. Uh, support for a diversity of uh, storage media. So again, there's no sort of uh, concern here with a, any particular technology. This is really just about how the content is structured. Um, yeah, and finally, the notion of completeness so that um, you can potentially rebuild a repository just from the, uh, the files that, uh, that the repository is managing. So uh, on, the, uh, on this notion of parsability, um, just to go a little bit deeper here, um, the idea here is really focused around disaster recovery situations. So in the event where the, the, the application is in some kind of unrecoverable state, uh, that humans would be able to uh, get the content, whether it's on a hard disk or cloud storage or whatever, uh, and be able to at least understand the basic structure of it without uh, needing to, to reference the, uh, uh, the application. Um, and th there's some, uh, just an example here that uh, 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 shows you sort of the basic structure of uh, what an OCFL uh, object looks like. But there's also a focus on uh, machine readability, of course, and, and there's a clear benefit here around um, other applications, clients that might understand OCFL that could be uh, put on top of a, a storage route and, and actually understand the contents um, in, the, in the repository. Uh, this notion of robustness, so there is this strong notion of fixity that is uh, built into the OCFL um, and uh, uh, you can validate content. Uh, there are inventory files and so uh, everything that's contained within these objects can be, uh, can be validated um, and the objects themselves can be completely self-contained. Uh, versioning, of course, is a, is a major feature here. Uh, the idea being that objects can be, uh, changes to objects can be tracked over time. Uh, the OCFL uh, uses a concept called forward delta, uh, which kind of reduces the amount of content stored. And essentially how this works is uh, every time you create a new version, a new version directory is created, but only content that is changed actually gets uh, moved into this new version directory. So if you have an object that has many components and you just create a new version that updates one of those components, 
that new version directory is only going to contain the updated content. All of the unchanged content will still exist in the uh, previous version directory where, wherever it was originally created. Um, and, and all of this stuff can be tracked and reconstructed, uh, again, using these, uh, these uh, inventory files. Uh, storage diversity, of course, is, is very important, and it is designed to work with various infrastructures, including cloud offerings, um, such as Amazon. Um, it, using this sort of conventional file system metaphor of, you know, files and folders as a way of uh, uh, organizing content. Um, and, you know, you can use this to ensure a certain level of deduplication to lower sort of your, your overall storage costs. Uh, the notion of completeness here, I think, is really important. So um, with the OCFL, you have the complete intellectual object, meaning all of the metadata and all the data that are associated with it that are, are stored together. Um, it, really, this falls in line with uh, a lot of uh, standards, the trusted digital repositories, uh, NDSA levels of preservation, um, OAIS, et cetera. And you know, a lot of these standards really tell you you um, what you should do, but they don't really do uh, a lot of uh, information on how to do it. Uh, and so that's really one of the things that the OCFL is intended to provide is, is the how of uh, uh, doing these uh, kinds of digital preservation activities. Uh, and so taken all together, really you can think of this as the kind of, uh, you know, insurance against the end of the world uh, scenario where, you know, everything is rubble but uh, uh the hand bursts out of the rubble with the uh, with the hard drive and uh you know with uh, with no no reference to the application you can uh, reconstruct all of your data and interpret it um just by referencing the uh, uh the hard drive itself uh you know after you find food and shelter and whatever else you need in the event of the apocalypse um so in terms of kind of the overall benefits here this is just trying to kind of summarize um what this is offering uh specifically to fedora um, really, this notion of application independent persistence, I think, is quite important. Uh, and the idea here is just that your your data exists uh, separate from Fedora itself. And so in the future, uh, if Fedora were to go away, you were to migrate to a different system, um, none of your uh, data is actually dependent on the application itself. Uh, so it's a strong guard against the, those kinds of uh, uh, disaster recovery scenarios or uh, migrating to uh, different applications. But there's also this, uh, this idea of being able to completely rebuild the repository just from the contents on disk. And this was a feature that existed in Fedora 3, for those of you that were using uh, that version of the software and may still be using it, um, that didn't make its way into versions 4 and 5, uh, but that we're bringing back into uh, version 6. But really in a much more robust way. Um, by complying with this uh, OCFL standard, um, we really get to do this, not just in a kind of custom Fedora way, but in a way that's uh, compliant with, uh, uh, with an external standard. Um, then on the topic of migrations, um, I think this is a really important feature. Um, in terms of being able to make migrations easier, I'm gonna talk a little bit about exactly how this works, but essentially um, you can take your Fedora 3 data, for example, and use a tool which we have to transform that data into a format that is compatible with Fedora 6 and OCFL um, basically in place. And so it doesn't require uh, importing and exporting through an API layer, which uh, in version four and five uh, has uh, caused some performance issues with uh, being able to uh, migrate large amounts of data. Um, so it really makes it easier to, to do a migration uh, but it also insulates you against future migrations. And this is one of the uh, clear benefits of the OCFL where uh, applications in the future and certainly future versions of Fedora can be written to comply with the OCFL format on disk rather than the uh, data being transformed to comply with whatever format the application uh, wants to use. Uh, and, and so this really, I think, helps uh, mitigate future migration scenarios, uh, which is important because data really isn't getting any smaller. Uh, and as we manage larger and larger amounts of data in our repositories, having a system where applications can be written to um, map to that data, maybe with some minimal transformation happening, um, really makes it a lot easier to uh, you know, do these kinds of software upgrades in the future.
So uh, that's really just a brief overview of uh, the OCFL. Um, right now, uh, there is a, a beta release of, uh, of the spec and, and you can go uh, take a look at that. Uh, there's a number of work that's been going on. So I, I should say that this effort is really not a Fedora effort. It's something that is related to Fedora and certainly we're participating in it as a, as a community effort. But um, really this is, uh, uh, there's a, a whole larger group and larger community around the OCFL that's um, concerned with digital preservation. And so there's some activities. I've, I've linked to a few things here and, and, and again, we'll provide the slides so you can kind of click through these if, you, if you'd like to do that. Um, but there have been some clients that have been developed uh, and reference implementations as well as uh, validators that, um, uh, will uh, validate the, the content in place. So um, lots of great work there. Um, I'd certainly encourage you to go take a look at that if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the OCFL. Um, if you'd like to participate in that community specifically, there's a few channels. Um, there is a, an OCFL community Google group. Um, there's a link here. If you just go to ocfl.io, that's where you'll find the, the latest release and any kind of current drafts if you wanna take a look at that stuff. Um, there are also monthly community calls uh, that you can join in on. Uh, there is a Slack channel. It, it's a channel within the Fedora uh, Slack, uh, which you'd be welcome to join. Uh, there are use cases um, and uh, GitHub issues that uh, you can submit if you, if you do have issues, but lots of ways to participate in that community. Um, and again, it's, it's independent of Fedora, but it's something that we're implementing within Fedora uh, because it makes sense for, for our use cases as well. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about where we are in the Fedora 6 development process and what comes next. Um, we are doing this by uh, through four code sprints. Uh, so we've already uh, completed two of those code sprints. Uh, we had really great participation from the community um, and I, I sent out um, a, a demo uh, as well as a summary if you'd like to take a look at that. Uh, and then we have two other code sprints that are planned in 2020, which uh, would certainly encourage um, anyone who's interested to uh, to get involved with. Um, we're also working with pilot partners, and I think this is really important. I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a second, but um, we really want to make sure that the work we're doing is validated by uh, the community. Uh, and so we have partner institutions that are kind of working alongside us as we uh, build and test the, the code and the tooling, uh, but we're also very interested in community reporting and feedback. So uh, when I sent out the summary of the sprint, I, I also sent out a a Google form that you can use to provide some feedback if you'd like to try the tooling. Um, but all, of course, all along this process, we're going to try to provide as much regular reporting as, as possible. So webinars like this, but also um, sprint summaries and, and uh, uh, other kind of ways of, of communicating out progress. And, and really, if you have any feedback along the way or questions, uh, I'd certainly encourage you to reach out. And I do have the communication channels listed uh, later in this presentation if you want to uh, take advantage of any of those. And of course, none of this would be possible without all the support that we get from the uh, community of institutions that uh, funds our, our work. So th this is just a, a, a sort of collage of all the institutions that are currently uh, members that support Fedora financially. And really this is the only way that we can support staff on the project and facilitate all the work that we're doing with the uh, upgrades and migrations and, and building out Fedora 6. Um, it, it, so if you're a member of any of these institutions, I certainly want to say thank you. Uh, it's really, the, again, the only way that we can continue to do this work. Um, and if you're a current user or, or a, a prospective future Fedora user uh, and your institution is, is not yet a member, I'd really encourage you to, uh, to join up. There's, there's uh, membership levels at uh, all different kind of funding tiers, depending on the size of your institution and, and what's a, a reasonable uh, amount on, a, on an annual basis um, and benefits associated with membership as well. But really, this is just the way that uh, we're able to fund our work and, and make sure that we can continue to uh, develop and deliver on Fedora 6 and, uh, and future releases of the software. Uh, and of course, the, the pilot partners, as I mentioned, are, are really important as well. We're, we're working closely with three institutions, uh, DocuTeam out of uh, Switzerland and uh, the National Library of Medicine and University of Wisconsin-Madison in, in the United States. Uh, and certainly these institutions don't represent the entire community, uh, but they're institutions that we can work with closely, uh, attending weekly tech calls, uh, building and testing uh, the, the tooling, providing sample data, uh, and providing really quick feedback um, as we sort of iterate through the process. Uh, each of these institutions 
is uh, also a member uh, of uh, in, in support of Fedora, so they're uh, providing some uh, funding, uh, and also actually representatives from each of these institutions sits on the Fedora uh, governance group. So, you know, there's a lot of really close contact here, and I think this will help us make sure that we're building software and building tooling that responds to the needs of the communities. But um, certainly, again, if, if you're um, interested in testing some of this uh, uh, the, the tooling uh, as we produce it and providing some feedback. Uh, we do want to hear from the community more broadly, not, not just this uh, small uh, uh, group of institutions. So in terms of the progress to date, uh, as I said, we just completed our, uh, our second code sprint. Um, and so we're just kind of putting the finishing touches on uh, basic resource management. Uh, so in this case, that's kind of reading and writing uh, from the Fedora application to the uh, OCFL storage layer um, uh, using the uh, uh, building and, and managing containers. Um, and we'll continue to sort of iterate on, on that support um, uh, over the next uh, couple of code sprints to, to, to build it up. Um, but one of the most significant things we produced is an upgraded version of um, this migration utility, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, that now supports an in-place transformation to um, content that is uh, compatible with uh, Fedora 6 or will be once it's released um, and, and the OCFL. Um, so I, I linked here if you want to take a look at the summary and, and the demo. We recorded a, a brief demo that uh, uh, sort of walks through how to actually use this tool. Um, and I'll talk about it here briefly in a moment. Um, but, but I think this is quite significant because it does allow uh, anyone who's interested, anyone who has Fedora 3 data in particular, uh, to just download the tool and um, test it out over a, a sample of your, your data um, and, and just see if, uh, if what's being output on the other side uh, meets your use cases, uh, if you have concerns about it or, or issues where your data is not being transformed properly. Um, we can address that now ra ra rather than waiting until you know, Fedora 6 is fully released and, and then trying to go back and, and address those, um, those kinds of concerns. So this is just a, a screenshot of, of the tool. And again, I'm not gonna go into a ton of uh, technical detail here, but um, really this is just a Java command line tool. Uh, it has a few options um, for uh, you know, declaring the uh, type of Fedora 3 data you're working with, where your objects and data streams are and, and where you'd like to export to. Um, but it does an in-place data conversion um, and it's, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, and pretty performant because it's just um, running through that uh, transformation uh, in place. Um, and this is just a screenshot off of my own laptop to, to show you an example of what that data might uh, look like. Of course, it'll be a little bit different in, in, you know, in everyone's uh, own unique use cases, but um, essentially you have a pretty simple folder-based structure. Um, each of the top level folders represents a, an object from the Fedora 3 repository. And within each one of those, there are uh, version directories, uh, which contain content directories, which contain the data streams. Um, and throughout here, there are some kind of details of OCFL that I didn't go into um, throughout the presentation, but uh, just declarations of the version of the uh, specification that um, uh, this particular output complies with, as well as the uh, inventory files. And, and again, if you're looking for details on that, um, it, all of the links to the OCFL uh, will, will kind of explain how, how all of that stuff works. But uh, it's pretty simple, uh, reasonably human readable, um, and uh, compatible with both the OCFL and uh, what will be the Fedora 6 application. Uh, and so the nice thing here is that when Fedora 6 is ready to go, uh, you'll be able to just drop a Fedora 6 application on top of this um, transformed data and, and be able to read and write from it. So you won't have to um, you know, import all of this through an API or some other mechanism that might um, you know, really slow things down. Uh, so you know, on the topic of sort of lowering the effort required to migrate. I think that does significantly um, kind of reduce the, you know, the effort required to actually get content into the system. So in, in terms of timelines, um, we uh, anticipate having some early testable code uh, really within the next week or two here. The, the tech team uh, continuing to do some work outside of the, the last code sprint and are putting the finishing touches on some code that um, will allow you to actually stand up the application and, and just do some basic kind of reading and writing uh, of, uh, of content. Uh, and we anticipate being able to provide uh, a demo or at least a summary of that work um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, and of course, in uh, uh, the first half of 2020, we're um, going to be running a couple of other code sprints um, and there's still an opportunity 
now of course to sign up for those if you're interested in participating. Um, but we'll be running those for the first half of the year and anticipating sometime uh, mid to late next year being able to have uh, an initial release of, uh, of the software. And of course, along the way, we're really eager to produce as much uh, migration tooling uh, and support as we can for, uh, for that side of things. Um, and so Fedora 6 is not only for those migrating from Fedora 3. I think the, the features around OCFL and, and sort of um, uh, mitigating against future migrations are, are, are pretty compelling, even for people that are newly adopting the software or might be migrating from a different platform. Um, but certainly for those that are currently using Fedora 3 and just haven't made the jump uh, to uh, version four or five, um, I think version six really offers a, a, an opportunity to uh, move forward to a supported version of the software. So if you'd like to get involved, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, I've linked here to this migration utility and there's a form that you can use to provide some feedback. Um, and we'd really love to hear if this is working for you, if you have questions or concerns about it. Um, and certainly we'll provide some additional links once the, um, the uh, testable version of the software is available. Um, you can also sign up for the next sprint. There's a link here. Uh, it's just a doodle poll uh, that you can fill out if you'd like to participate um, or if anyone from your institution would like to participate. And this is not just for developers. Uh, we have a lot of documentation tasks that need to be taken care of as well as testing and validation. So really it's, it's, it's uh, you know, any kinds of skill sets uh, would be useful to, uh, to have in, involved in these sprints. And it's a good opportunity to kind of uh, get your feet wet with, uh, with the software. Um, we use Slack quite a bit now to uh, carry on a lot of the conversations. Of course, there are still mailing lists and uh, you're welcome to use the, uh, the mailing lists as well, but um, we, we do have a Slack uh, organization and uh, there's a lot of conversation that, uh, uh, that happens on there through the various channels. Um, and as I said before, becoming a member is a really great way to support the work that we're doing. Uh, it just ensures that we can continue to staff the project appropriately um, and uh, facilitate the, uh, uh, the development of uh, Fedora 6 and the migration tooling and everything else that we're, um, that we're trying to do. So I have a few links here. Um, there's a design page if you wanna take a look at that um, and the, uh, uh, the actual OCFL uh, landing page if, if you wanna investigate more uh, of the OCFL. Uh, and of course, you're always welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, and my email address is there. Um, I'm going to try to move this into uh, a Q&A mode now. Um, but your, uh, this is really just your opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. So uh, I've turned that on. I'll, I'll also open the, uh, the chat here. Um, and uh, if we can uh, unmute folks will will try to do that but certainly if you have uh questions you can uh you can type them in so um uh, just let me know if you're not seeing the option to uh participate in in the q a um but the uh you're welcome to use the, the q a box uh or just type something into the uh to the webinar chat i'm, I'm gonna monitor um, that as well as best i can here Uh, so I see a question here, uh, is there going to be a migration path from Fedora 4 to 6? Uh, yes. So uh, in this case, we already have uh, a, an import export utility that works with uh, Fedora 4 and 5. So it allows you to uh, export your uh, export that, uh, that data. And so we're going to update that tool uh, so that it will, when, when Fedora 6 is ready, um, that you'll be able to uh, get your data out and transform it uh, and, uh, and put that into um, uh, into a Fedora 6 application. Um, there's another question here. Uh, uh, will API X commands and modules uh, become a part of Fedora 6? Uh, so I, I would say yes. I, I don't think there's been a lot of work that's gone into this so far, but uh, the API X modules really work against the Fedora API layer, uh, which I think is fortunate for us. Uh, so. Uh, there'll probably be some updates that need to be done to those modules just because there may be some changes to the API in Fedora 6, but we're not anticipating really uh, significant ones. Um, so I, I would say if anyone is using API X and, and, and interested in that uh, particular application, um, I, I'd encourage you to, to reach out and, and feel free to send me an email about it. Um, but uh, we can certainly start a conversation about that because I, I don't think it's um, going to be, uh, because it works against the API and we're not making major API changes, uh, I wouldn't anticipate a, a lot of difficulty there. Um, 
uh, there is a question about the differences in APIs between four and six. So, uh, so I didn't talk too much about version changes and maybe I'll say a few words here. Um, when we went from three to four, Fedora three to Fedora four, that was a complete application rewrite, really major changes. Uh, between version four and five, we essentially just adopted semantic versioning as um, a standard way of doing version numbers. And that just means anytime we make a change that's considered significant, such as a breaking API change, that we uh, increment the, the digit. So uh, Fedora 5 really was just the uh, release of the API specification and, and alignment with that specification. The application itself didn't change much between 4 and 5, um, but in particular, the versioning API went through some changes uh, and there were some other kind of API changes around authorization as well. So uh, there were some changes there, um, but then from version five to six, we actually don't anticipate very much change at the API layer at all. Um, mostly the changes will be under the hood at this persistence layer. Uh, and, and so what that means is uh, any applications that were built on Fedora five and are compatible with Fedora five won't need to change much if at all in order to adopt Fedora six. One thing I didn't mention is we are building a kind of uh, built-in query service in Fedora 6, and that would likely have um, an API access point, but that would just be, that wouldn't be a, a sort of breaking change. It would just be a, a new feature uh, of the API. So some changes between four and five in the API layer, not that many changes between five and six. Um, there's a question about does, uh, so I can say answer live here. Okay, uh, does OCFL allow store in MySQL? How performant are OCFL files versus a DB in scale? Yeah, so this is something that we're gonna be working on probably in the next code sprint. Um, we anticipate that there's going to be a layer kind of in between the Fedora API and the OCFL persistence that will probably involve, uh, you know, caching and databases. Um, and so one of the things that we, want to do as we build this out is, is really do some detailed performance testing. So we don't know yet what those performance characteristics are going to look like, but I would say if anyone is really interested in the performance and scale side of this, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out. Um, you could, you could send me an email or you can uh, jump on the mailing list or on Slack. Um, if you have some requirements and, or particularly if you're interested in doing some testing, I would anticipate early next year, we, we really want to dig in on that. Um, Cause of course we don't want to be just reading and writing from disks all the time would be slow. Um, and so we do anticipate that there will be some, some kind of middle uh, layer there that would involve uh, some combination of, uh, of databases, but we're, uh, we haven't quite got there yet. Um, so the question about scalability in Fedora 5, uh, especially because of mode shape. So there were, have been a couple of things that have been raised in the community. Uh, one is just on ingest. Uh, so if you're doing a migration and you just have a lot of data, particularly if you have complex uh, resources that have a lot of components to them, because it's a REST API, everything gets uh, kind of ingested one at a time. Uh, and so there are some uh, speed issues there with, with putting the data in. And, and that's something that being able to do an in-place data transformation will really assist with because you won't have to go through the API. Um, on the other side, there have been some issues with um, just uh, uh, containers that have many, many children associated with them at, at any given level of the repository. Uh, and there are ways to mitigate these. Um, and uh, uh, if you'd like, if, if uh, uh, if you want to reach out, I can point you to um, some of the documentation on that. Uh, the, the the performance and scale issues happen only under particular scenarios, but for those of it, that have encountered them, they've uh, certainly been a hindrance to to using the software. Um, but all of them are things that we can sort of trace back to uh, mode shape, and we're pretty confident that in version six um, we'll be able to eliminate those. So if you're using four or five and running into those issues, um, certainly feel free to reach out. But I, I think we are. Um, we're, we're anticipating being able to address those as we um, uh, as we build out the software. Uh, let's see. When using OCFL, what happens to a Fedora repository if another application writes changes to the file system outside of Fedora? Uh, will this break the uh, the repo? So here you're talking about a scenario where you have more than one application that are uh, writing to the uh, writing to the OCFL. Uh, 
on the file system, whether this will break the repo. So um, I know this has come up uh, during the development. Um, so this is a scenario that certainly is being anticipated. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the exact uh, solution to this uh, will be, whether it's um, you know using some kind of file locking um, or, or, or what have you, but it, it is something that um, we're certainly uh, anticipating. So um, uh, with that one, uh, I think probably it's easiest for me to uh, check in with the with the technical team to see sort of where we are with that question uh, and and report back on it. Um, so maybe I'll try to save that and and Oliver, I can um, get back to you on on that question specifically because um, I, I don't have a probably a great answer for you right now. But I know that that question has come up um, and we're just not quite there yet in terms of um, uh, addressing that particular concern. Uh, does Fedora 6 solve the problem of single domain restriction that Fedora 4 and 5 have? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, in Fedora 4 and 5, those of you that are using linked data and that have played around with the application, um, you may have noticed that uh, Fedora, if you put um, RDF triples into Fedora, uh, the subject of all of those triples has to be a Fedora resource. So you can't have kind of arbitrary uh, RDF triples stored in Fedora uh, that reference a subject that is outside of the repository. Um, and for most applications that are using Fedora just as a kind of an object repository, that, that's fine. Uh, but for anyone who uh, is using Fedora as a, more of a linked data platform, that can be a restriction. Um, so that is something that we are planning to lift in uh, uh, in Fedora 6. So yeah, we, we that restriction, uh, we are planning on rolling that back so that you will be able to um, put whatever kind of RDF you want into into Fedora, and it can have subjects outside of the um, the, the single domain. So, so yeah, that that should be a, a question that uh, or, or an issue that we'll be able to address. Uh, there was also a question here in the chat. Uh, do you anticipate that? future releases of Fedora, 7, 8, et cetera, will be slower following up on the point of fewer future migrations. Yeah, if you're talking about, are we gonna release kind of major versions of Fedora more slowly? Uh, quite likely, yes. I mean, we've, we've already committed to not releasing more than one major release per year. And so that, that doesn't mean that we'll necessarily even do a major release per year. We may have some years where we just don't do a major release. Um, I don't think we've thought too far yet beyond what the major changes might look like after Fedora 6. Um, so we don't have anything on the immediate roadmap there, which makes me think that, you know, quite likely those major future releases would, would be slower um, or would just come out less often, although we'll certainly do as many minor and bug fix releases as we need. Um, but uh, at, at the same time, even if we do put out new major releases of the software. Uh, the fact that we'll be compliant with OCFL means that we won't anticipate sort of major uh, import export activities even with those those newer versions. Um, if there was a data change required, it'd probably just be kind of made in place. Uh, but, but overall, yeah, I would say probably a slower major release cycle um, and, and certainly fewer fewer migrations. Uh, so there's a question about the admin interface being a useful element of Fedora 3, and is this available in Fedora 6? So there is an administrative interface in Fedora 4 and 5, uh, but it's not the same as the one in Fedora 3. The, the Fedora 3 interface is a Flash-based interface, and it, it does have some nice kind of features around XML editing and things like that. Um, the Fedora 4 and 5 interface uh, is a little bit more minimal. It does allow you to kind of uh, create and manage RDF-based metadata and, and create and manage containers and binaries. Um, this interface will, of course, still be in Fedora 6, um, but if you're interested in some additional features in that interface, um, I'd certainly encourage you to reach out. Um, that interface can always change. It just hasn't really been uh, a priority because we haven't had a lot of demand for uh, updating it. And really all it is is just a, a a, a view, an HTML view of, of the, uh, a subset of the API uh, features. So 
um, that interface will still be there. But if there's something in particular from the Fedora 3 interface that you'd really like to see, um, certainly let us know because that, that is, if, if there's interest in particular, if there's people in the community that are willing to, to uh, contribute uh, to that, then uh, you know, that, that interface can certainly be uh, updated. Okay. Uh, is Fedora 6, 6 still focused on LDP or is the project moving away and towards a general store and preservation platform? So we're still maintaining our commitment to LDP. Uh, and, and that is, um, you know, when I said earlier that we're minimizing changes at the API layer, th that's really what I mean by that. So the Fedora API specification uh, specifically mentions LDP, the, the linked data platform, which is a, a specification. Um, and uh, aligns with it in the way that we do uh, resource management. So that's not changing. I would say that, you know, having accomplished what we wanted to at the API layer with regard to how we're using things like linked data and, and various other web standards, uh, really we just want to return the focus now to the back end of Fedora and get some of the digital preservation and migration issues resolved. Um, uh, well, I should say migration issues and there's not really uh, issues with digital preservation. We just want to enhance what's already there. Um, and, and so that's a big part of the, the work that we're doing here. So it's not, certainly not an abandonment of, of LDP. In fact, we're, we're committed to, um, you know, not making major changes at the API layer for this version. I'm not, I'm not sure about future versions, but uh, I wouldn't anticipate, um, having just gone through a major effort on the API side, I, I wouldn't anticipate us making uh, major changes there anytime soon. Uh, building on my previous question, will Fedora 6 provide LDP notifications, container support, et cetera? So uh, Fedora 6 uh, right now on the roadmap is Fedora, for Fedora 6 to provide essentially all of the same LDP functionality that is provided in Fedora 5. Um, if there are some additional things uh, around notifications or other uh, other features. I mean, certainly the, the different types of containers, um, direct, indirect, and basic are all, all supported in Fedora 5 and will continue to be supported in Fedora 6. Um, yeah, if, if there are other features there that um, would uh, would be of interest, uh, we certainly like to hear about those. There, there, There's nothing really on the roadmap right now for changes at that layer. This is really uh, largely intended to be changes at the persistence, uh, uh, the persistence layer. Um, but there's always opportunities to add new features if, if those are desired by the community. Uh, oh, I already answered this one about um, whether future uh, releases would be um, slower. So yeah, that one's, that one's answered. Uh, which versions of Fedora will be considered as an LTS? So yeah, we do have this um, long-term support concept uh, where we've committed to uh, supporting certain releases with uh, uh, bug fixes, security fixes, et cetera, for um, three year periods. And so right now Fedora version 4.7.5 is an LTS version. So we've committed to at least kind of three years of support there. Um, and I would imagine that Fedora 6 would likely be such a release as well. Uh, we haven't made any decisions about that yet, but um, I, I would certainly anticipate that uh, that Fedora 6 would be considered a, a long-term support release, uh, you know, once we've kind of tested it and, and validated it um, uh, within the community. Um, yeah. Uh, are you aware of any other applications that are building on top of OCFL? So, you know, OCFL is is relatively new as a, as a standard. Uh, there are quite a few applications that are very interested in using OCFL and a number of institutions that are building uh, clients for, uh, for OCFL. So uh, certainly the, the, the folks at Stanford and, and the folks at Oxford have, have started working on clients and intend to use it uh, in their own uh, applications. Uh, and we've heard from some of the uh, proprietary uh, vendors that there's an interest in OCFL as well. Um, I, I think just because the spec is not yet in an officially released format, uh, we haven't seen any sort of, you know, official applications that have adopted it yet. But um, we've we've heard quite a bit of interest from, from people across the community. And there's a lot of um, work being done right now to develop clients, validators, et, et cetera, and, and certainly plans to um, implement it. Um, but uh, uh, 
there's none that I've um, completed it yet, uh, just because the, um, the the specification itself is not um, fully released, although it's um, it's fairly close. Uh, so I, I don't see any other questions, but I think we have um, potentially another 15 minutes, um, although I'm happy to uh, end things whenever uh, whenever the questions are, are complete. Um, I'll leave this Q&A open for another few minutes here and, and just feel free to drop something in if, if you do have a, a question, I'm, I'm happy to uh, respond to that. Um, and, and certainly otherwise, as I said before, uh, we have a number of communication channels and uh, you know I, I'd encourage everyone, uh, if you do have an interest in getting involved, um, it, particularly, you know, some of these questions I think would be good to uh, raise, uh, you know, within the within the broader community or at least the the, the technical team to make sure um, anything around features or, or anything like that um, or performance and scale uh, really are the things that we want to make sure are part of the discussion. So um, if you're not sure exactly how to get involved, feel free to send me an email. Um, and I can point you in the right direction, but uh, the mailing list, the Slack channel, anything like that would be uh, good uh, good venues. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll save the recording for uh, for this uh, for this webinar and send it out because I, I know there were a number of people that weren't able to um, uh, to to register. So uh, we'll we'll make this available to the to the community, uh, and, and we'll continue to um, you know do these kinds of uh, communications as uh, as often as we can. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing any other open questions. So, um, oh, uh, we've got one more. Uh, will the upgrade utility be maintained for a long while? Uh, yes, I, I would. I would think so. So, um, you know, this these upgrades are are relatively new. Um, but one of the things that we've really heard from the community and that we recognize is that, um, you know, migration support is, is really important. Having robust tooling, documentation, you know, uh, use cases, case studies, all those kinds of things. So um, the utility, uh, you know, that we're providing for, for upgrades, uh, I would certainly anticipate that that will be maintained for, uh, for quite some time, unless it gets you know, replaced or superseded by um, something that is uh, is better. But, um, you know, a significant portion of the community is still using Fedora 3. And, and so we really want to uh, try to provide as many uh, opportunities as possible for, for those institutions to make the move to a, a supported version of, of the software. Um, so yes, I, I would anticipate that the tooling will be um, maintained for uh, for some time. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything else in the in the chat or the Q&A, so I think we can probably uh, stop things there. So uh, thanks very much. Um, oh, maybe one final one here. What percentage of your users still use Fedora 3? It, it's a little bit difficult to say, um, but uh, we it, it's certainly a, a, a major uh, portion of the community. Uh, you know, we, we said in the designing migration path, uh, we sent out a survey asking institutions what version um, they were still using, and a majority of those that responded were still using Fedora 3. Um, however, that doesn't, uh, that's not representative of the community as a whole, that's just the, the people that happen to respond to that survey. But uh, it is certainly a significant portion of the community that's still using Fedora 3. Um, uh, there's a question here too about Fedora 3, there was an OAI endpoint that could use proprietary metadata, is something similar available? Um, yeah, we've had, heard some interest in uh, the, the OAI endpoint, and actually this is something that I think will be made easier by the uh, search functionality that we're building in. So especially on the developer side, uh, there have been a lot of folks that have been interested in having uh, a built-in uh, sort of query, very, very basic query endpoint uh, as part of the software. Um, those of you that are familiar with Fedora, uh, Fedora 4 and 5 might know that currently the software doesn't have a built-in um, search endpoint. We rely on indexing to an external um, solar or elastic search or, or what have you uh, endpoint, which works well because those applications are great at search and we didn't have any desire to duplicate solar within Fedora. Um, but there are a lot of folks that are interested in having a sort of built-in query endpoint for really just kind of basic um, search uh, searches. And so, um, 
once we've got that built into Fedora 6, we can use that as a way to build um, uh, a, uh, an OAI endpoint. Um, so I, I know there's some folks in the community that are, that are interested in that. Um, and I think as we move along with it, um, maybe I can put out a message to the community, again, asking who might be interested in, in such an endpoint and just sort of collaborating and making sure we get the, uh, the features right. But I, I think with Fedora 6, it would be much easier to um, build in uh, that kind of an OAI uh, module because we'll have the, the, the basic search functionality. Um, uh, there's a question about OCFL effectively replacing Fox, uh, Foximal, which was the kind of XML standard Fedora used in Fedora 3 uh, to construct objects. I mean, effectively, uh, Foximal was replaced in Fedora 4 when we moved to um, a system where we had the uh, objects essentially stored in a database with their um, with properties, uh, and that was sort of replacing the, the this concept of, of Foximal. Um, in Fedora 6, uh, yeah, the, you, you could think of the OCFL as effectively replacing uh, Foxmall, although all the information that's contained in that, uh, that structure can still be migrated. So there won't be any data loss, but, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of concept of structuring objects around an XML wrapper, uh, that's not something that um, is, uh, that's not the way that, that OCFL works. So, so yeah, in a way you could think of it as replacing it. Um, and in terms of audit trails, the, these can definitely be migrated, and we've, we've uh, tested that out with um, the, the sample migration. So um, right now, it'll just kind of grab the, the audit trail and, and preserve that in, in Fedora 6 as part of the, the OCFL objects. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're designing the migration utility so that there's not any data loss between the migration between Fedora 3 and 6, uh, although it would be very good to validate that. So I would say anyone who has Fedora 3 data that are that's interested in OCFL and concerned, you know, that things might not be migrated in exactly the way that you want. Um, it's it's fairly easy to set up the utility and uh, and, and do a migration um, into the uh, uh, in, into the system. So I, I'd certainly encourage you to uh, try that out. Um, uh, there's another question here. Will the version of OCFL used in the eventual release of Fedora 6 be targeting the 0.3 beta, or is the 1.0 release of OCFL slated around that point? I mean, ideally we'd be targeting the 1.0. Um, right now we're uh, using the 0.3 beta because that's what currently exists, but um, I think the OCFL community is anticipating a 1.0 release in the not too distant future. Uh, and as soon as that's available, I think we would update whatever the, uh, you know, the current state of Fedora 6 is to work with this uh, with this 1.0 release. Um, it, it may happen that they don't align perfectly uh, in terms of their release dates, but but that's that's the, the goal I think is, is to you know align with an officially released version of the spec whenever that's um, available and we'll just make whatever changes we have to uh, to make in between to um, to make that work. Um, there was a question about whether PIDs will still be available to use. Um, I think some of the details there are, are still be working out, still being worked out in terms of what uh, the, the information certainly is still going to be preserved, but sort of uh, in what format Fedora 3 PIDs are available in Fedora 6. Uh, I think there's still some work going on there to, to determine exactly what that's going to look like. Uh, and again, I, I think if you, uh, if you use Fedora 3, and you're uh, really interested in maintaining your uh, your PIDs uh, in in Fedora six. Uh, I'd encourage you to reach out uh, and and you know because I can follow up with the with the tech team and, and see kind of what the current state of this um, this work is at. But um, you know because we had been asking questions about you know whether folks wanted to be able to sort of continue to use their Fedora three PIDs in Fedora six or whether it was okay to just store them, but use a new identifier um, in the Fedora 6 content, uh, context. So I, I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out um, and, and we can make sure that if you have a strong use case there that it's, that it's represented. Um, a question about the concept of content modeling returning in Fedora 6. Uh, probably not in the, in the sense that it was in, uh, in Fedora 3 where you, you created kind of a, an object that represented a, a content model, but um, there are still ways to do uh, content modeling in Fedora 6. If anything, it's more flexible um, with how you sort of 
organize your uh, your content, but um, you know, using uh, using RDF essentially and, and different ontologies, you can sort of construct uh, you know determine how you want your your content to uh, to look and and, and be structured. Um, there's actually a lot of really good conversations uh, if you happen to be on the Islandora. Uh, mailing lists or or in their Slack channel. I, I know there's been a lot of very good conversations lately about sort of content modeling in, in Fedora 6 because uh, Islandora has traditionally made very extensive use of content models. Um, and as they move to the next version of Islandora, uh, there's been a lot of really good conversations there. So um, th that might be a good place to go have a look and I can point you to the relevant discussions if you're not sure where to go. Um, but uh, that's been pretty, uh, th th there's been a lot of conversations there. Um, I'll try to get through, we've only got five minutes left, so let me see if I can um, get through a few of these. It looks like there's only a few left. Uh, when will Fedora 6 be available? So ideally sometime later next year, a lot of it depends on community contributions. We, we've made really good progress so far, but we have a couple of code sprints uh, in the early part of 2020. Uh, and we'll need to have, good participation from the community, both uh, you know, within those sprints and in between those sprints, as well as uh, testing and, and validation of, of the output. So uh, yeah, ideally uh, later next year, but a, a lot of it depends on sort of the level of community contribution that, that, we, uh, uh, that we get. So for anyone who has an interest in it and getting involved, there are lots of ways to do that, not even necessarily writing code, even just you know, uh, validating the output of, of what we're doing. Uh, you know, running the migration utility over some test data and letting us know how it goes. There are lots of ways to, to do that, um, but certainly would encourage you to, uh, to get involved. Uh, another question here, will there be anything like the Fedora 3 ingest function in 6? So uh, there's a, a few ways to get content into Fedora 6. Um, by default, it would either be through the REST API, which will be the same as it was in Fedora 5, but but also again because we're you know using the OCFL it's possible to uh, you know transform or just sort of uh, create content on disk or whatever your storage media is and organize it in a Fedora six and OCFL compatible way and then you know Fedora six will uh, be able to read and and understand that data so um, there, there are a couple of different ways and then if you're using a system like Islandora or a Sambera application, uh, they will have their own ingest methods and modules for getting content in. Um, so not the same as what was available in Fedora 3, but that there are, I think within the community uh, and within the software itself, uh, a few different ways of, uh, uh, of getting content into the system. And, and if anything, I think the OCFL does open up a new door for being able to get content in uh, that doesn't necessarily have to go through the API, although there's certainly some, um, you know, uh, transformations that would have to happen to make sure that the data is compatible. But it does give a new way of putting data in that, that um, it, you know, it might be more performant in some scenarios, particularly if you're doing a large batch of, of, of content. Um, okay, well, thanks for that last uh, batch of questions. Uh, looks like that's taken us really right up until the, uh, the, the top of the hour. So. Um, I think it's probably a good time to uh, close things off, but uh, thanks for all the engagement. I really appreciate everyone uh, showing up and, and asking all of your questions. Um, if there's any that I didn't give a satisfactory answer to, uh, feel free to, to drop me a, a, an email or, or, or anything like that, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up with you in more detail. Um, as I said, there's a lot of activity going on uh, with the tech team, and, and uh, I can certainly get more information if, uh, uh, if you need it. Um, but with that, um, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll follow up with uh, with the recording, um, and uh, see you uh, see you all next time.